everybody. I'm happy to see so many of you. It's lovely to see you all. And I hope you all are staying well. And before we start the evening's program, I just want to tell you about a few things we've got coming up. Um, on Malte Shabbat, February the 28th, there's going to be a national quiz. We expect you all to take part. <laughs> um, and the following Mount Shabbat, February, March the 6th, our very own Pamela Levine will be giving a presentation about her trip to, Ch to Japan, A Golden Ages Guide to Japan. That's Mount Shabbat, the 6th of March. On March the 18th, we have the HOB Rechovot AGM, which is normally a cheese and wine party, but this year you'll have to bring your own cheese and wine because it's Zoom. It will be followed by a musical quiz. And in, on, in April, Thursday, April the 22nd, we have um, a presentation from a guide of the British Museum talking about the 4,000 years of Jewish history on display in the British Museum. That's Thursday, April the 22nd. So we hope to see as many of you as possible for all those fantastic events. So um, now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the evening. Um, we are very honored to have with us Professor David Newman. Professor Newman was born and educated in the UK. He holds a bachelor's degree from the University of London and a PhD from Durham University. He came on Aliyah in, from the UK in 82, 1982 and has lived in Maytar since 1988, I believe, I read. Professor Newman holds the chair of geopolitics at Ben Gurion University, where he also founded the Department of Politics and Government in 1998 and the Center for European Studies in 2002 and served as the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities from 2010 to 2016. Uh, his work and publications focus, focus on geopolitics, territory and borders, and he's part of a global network of scholars and practitioners engaged in the field of border studies. His work also deals with the interfa interface of science and politics, and in recent years has published on topics relating to academic freedom, academic boycotts, and the structural and political organization of academia. In recent years, he's also undertaken a secondary research career relating to the history of Anglo Jewry, especially focusing on its religious institutions. So tonight he's going to share with us some exciting new research. Um, questions and answers to be kept till the end of the lecture, please. And the other thing I wish to tell you is that his speaker's fee has been donated to the Children's Hospital, the Schneider Children's Hospital. So um, it's my pleasure to hand over to, to Professor Newman. Do you want to uh, mute everybody, Steve? Everybody's yeah. muted. Oh, everybody's muted, okay. Okay, then I'm gonna put it into share. Um, da, 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 da. Um. Okay, good evening, everybody. It's lovely to be with you. Um, as we were chatting before you came online, um, Corona and Zoom has its uh, positive and negative aspects, but of, in terms of this sort of interaction, um, I've been giving uh, lots more talks to many different groups who, um, on, on a variety of topics over the past year, not just the regular sort of academic conferences or students, and um, it's always a great delight to meet other people. And I'm uh, particularly delighted actually to speak, uh, I don't think it's the first time, but oh, not, obviously not for a few years, to a hub event because um, my late mother, Rita Newman, until she passed away, was quite active in hub in Jerusalem um, after they came on Aliyah in the, in, in the late eighties. Um, and uh, as, uh, you mentioned in your introduction, the main area that I work in and have over the years, the sort of area I get paid by the university to work in, are all of the other topics like Anglo Jewry, which is great fun, and which I've got into quite a lot in the last few years, especially as I've been going back to London a lot and working in the uh, Jewish archives and London Metropolitan Archives, and a few other topics. Um, there's a sort of luxuries I allow myself as I approach retirement. Um, and less is expected of me in the institutional structure. But my main area of work has always been geopolitics, borders, uh, boundaries, and um, not necessarily the borders of Israel, although I'm going to be talking about the borders of Israel tonight. And I wouldn't say as much it's about new research, but it's a new way of um, focusing a lot of the work I've done on borders over the years. And it's all come about as a result of this plate 
that you see on your screen in front of you. It's a plate I discovered uh, the existence of about seven or eight years ago when I was in uh, the United States and one evening I was asked to give a talk, uh, probably by my university um, uh, associates, in a synagogue in a temple somewhere in Florida. I don't even remember exactly where it was. And I got there and I walked into the rabbi's office and this plate was on his wall. And I'd never seen it before and it dragged my interest. I spent six or seven years searching for one for on auctions around the world until finally just a few months ago, I managed to get hold of two of them. You know, it's like the London buses, you know, they never come along and when they come two come along at the same time. Um, actually, I could have got a third as well. I won't tell you what I paid for them. Uh, the one actually coming from Israel cost me more than the one I got from the United States. But um, I'm going to sort of talk today about the politics of maps, the geopolitics of maps, and use this plate as one example of what I want to talk about. Actually, I'm really going to come back to the plate only in the final section of my presentation. But um, any of you looking at that and any of you knowing the history of Israel, the history of its borders, will immediately see some interesting um, parts of the plate and raise questions, uh, which I'm going to relate to later on. Um, one of the, and I should say as well, that I'm um, dedicating this evening's lecture um, in the memory of the late Professor Moshe Brava. Um, some of you, if many of you have been in Israel 30, 40 and plus years, your children were all educated at Israeli schools, you all know that they were educated in what we we'll call the Atlas Brava, the Brava Atlases, both in schools and in universities. Um, although all my formal university education was in the UK, my first academic position when I came to Israel as a postdoc and a junior lecturer for five years before I then moved to Ben Gurion University was actually in the geography department in Tel Aviv University. And that was thanks to Moshe Brava. Um, he was at the time the Dean of Humanities. Um, and he was until he passed away just over a month ago, Israel's foremost cartographer, foremost uh, exponent of borders. He's written, as you can see, this book about the history of Israel's borders. Every few years, he was bringing out another atlas. And uh, we maintained very close contacts over the world, his, uh, over the time. His own personal history is fascinating. He was actually born in Israel or pre-state Palestine, but his father and grandfather were very orthodox rabbis from Vienna. They came from Austria. His father, Abraham Yeshua Brava, was actually, I suppose, Israel's first ever geographer. He wrote about it in Hebrew back in the 30s and the 40s. And Brava passed away just six weeks ago at the grand age of 101. Um, he actually was educated. His PhD was from London. Someone mentioned they lived in West Hampstead. He once told me that he got married in the Hampstead Synagogue in Dennington Park Road. Um, and... Um, after the war, he did a PhD in the LSE. He was also a reporter for Hatsofe at the time, and he covered the Rhodes Armistice Agreements, where, of course, the Israel's original borders were drawn up. And he then, back in Israel, he founded the geography departments in Tel Aviv and later in Barilan. He received the Israel Prize for his work in cartography. And he was, you know, at the age of 101, we were twice or three times a year, we had conversations about Israeli politics and maps and borders until about four or five years ago when they literally forced him to stop. He was giving lectures, regular courses to students, and he was quite an amazing character. And I thought, given the fact that this is going to be my topic tonight, it would be very right and proper to dedicate it to his memory. Um, I, what I want to do in this presentation is divide it into three. I want to say something very generally about the politics of maps. I'm not going to make it too academic, but I, you know, this is the framework I'm using for understanding this plate. So I want to talk about um, how political images um, are represented on maps. What you know, we always tend to look at maps and see them as very neutral, reliable documents, but that's not necessarily the case. There's a lot of politics, or there has been, involved in the way that maps are created and drawn. And I want to say something general about that. I then want to talk about um, a particular part, a particular period in the history of Israel's borders. 
um, particularly the period around the establishment of the state, 48, 49, because that's when this plate is relevant. And then at the very end, talk about the plate itself. But obviously, I'll be jumping forward and backward um, uh, every, every so often. And as was mentioned at the beginning, I like if you'll allow me to give a straight lecture for, say, 40 minutes, and then I'll be happy to field as many questions or challenges with people who don't agree with what I say. That's no problem, but I prefer it all to be focused at the end rather than during the presentation itself. Um, so let's move into the first section to, and say something generally about images and representations of, of maps. Uh, one of the areas of interest I have in recent years is the geopolitics of maps, the geopolitics of cartography. We're used to looking at maps and um, many of us uh, read maps better than others. Um, I've become aware over the years that many people don't even know how to look at a map. They don't know what way up to hold it and they don't really know what's north or south or right or left, especially when you stop people in the streets, which you don't have to anymore because you've all got GPS on your car, which means that even fewer people today look at maps or understand how to read maps. They simply put on the GPS and it says, depending on whether you choose an American voice or an English voice or an Israeli voice, it says, you know, uh, take the next right to the next roundabout, drive straight on. And people drive around the country and cities around the world without ever having any idea of where they're going or or, or, or where they're not going. I should say as an aside, I realized that many years earlier because as, a, as an English football fan, I used to, in the, as a kid in the 60s and 70s, follow my team around the country on a, you know, uh, looking at the map and seeing where is Manchester and where is Birmingham and where is Newcastle until I saw a documentary where they um, asked fans getting off the train in Euston or King's Cross who had just come back from a match they said, do you know where you've been? They said, yes, we've been to Manchester. Do you know where that is? No idea. We get on at one station, we get off at another station. The police hauled us into line so that we don't uh, cause any problems. And after the game, we're taken back to the station and get on the train again. So these people were traveling around the country week by week and had no idea of where they were going. Actually, overall, the, the, there is a tremendous lack of knowledge about basic, um, I would call it geography. Uh, and about, uh, you know, the use of maps and so on. But beyond the general use of maps, maps have had and continue to have a very important role to play in the political and geopolitical life of countries. Um, certainly in the past, certainly before maps became so freely available on the internet and on cyberspace, where you can literally go into Google Maps and just get the map of any place in the world down to the scale. You can even see the address, the house you used to live in. None of you have done that. Go into Google satellite and just write the, your old address from England and you'll probably get a picture of the house coming up this minute. Um, a few countries limited, such as Israel, because for security and strategic reasons, but overall you can get it. Um, but nevertheless, maps have often been used for political purposes and maps can be distorted. Um, the scale can be distorted. There's some very interesting maps of the Nazi period when Nazi Germany used all sorts of distorted scales on maps to try and justify their reasons for Lebensraum, speaking, uh, seeking space, obviously, and territory in other countries. The way the maps are drawn, the thickness of the lines, because, of course, there's a scale, and we'll talk about it in a few minutes, but the thickness of the green line on the Israeli maps post-48 you know, I'm holding up a finger here. If you put this finger on a map, the scale it covers could be tens, if not hundreds of square kilometers, depending on what the scale of the map is. So the thickness of the lines of the borders, the color of the settlements which are used, some colors are much more prominent than others. So if you're arguing, for instance, which we won't do in this discussion, you're arguing about the rights and wrongs, let's say, of settlements in the West Bank, and one side wants to prove its point, they can, if you look at Jewish agency and you look at Palestinian maps, one will put their own settlements in much stronger colors and the others in much weaker colors. So it looks as though their presence is actually greater or smaller than the other side. And of course, there's the issue of the language which is used on maps. What language is used to um, depict the names of places um, and, and so on. In the case of the history of Israel, uh, the late Meron Ben Venisti, a well-known sociologist who also passed away not so long ago, wrote a fascinating essay 
about 30 years ago about how his parents' generation, the early pioneers, without it meaning, uh, without the meaning to distort politics, Hebraized the maps of what was then Palestine because they wanted to put Jewish names, Hebrew names, names from the Tanakh uh, on the map. And of course, they changed many of the maps from being in Arabic to Hebrew or vice versa. Um, and so the language, of course, is very important. Who learns from the maps and who studies the maps? I became even more aware of that about 20 years ago when I was going to a conference, a geography conference in um, uh, Poland, which is the only, only a few years after it opened up again. So it's more than, than 20 years. And I was told that the conference is in Wroclaw, and I had absolutely no idea where Wroclaw was until someone said to me, of course, you know where Wroclaw is. It's Breslau, because Breslau is the name that Jews know the town by. And of course, after World War II, uh, Poland drove the ethnic Germans out back into Germany and populated it with people from further east, from Russia and from Poland. And all of the language changed. And it was only because I was coming through London at the time, I managed to get a hold of a map of the region, which had both the Polish and the German names on the map, and I could compare it to. So, of course, the way we use maps to socialize, to teach our children um, where places are, what they represent in history, um, can be distorted in, in many ways. Um, I, I don't remember the name of the book, but I read a tremendous story. Uh, it was a novel a few years ago, which was all about the importance, the political importance of maps um, going back three or 400 years when the Portuguese and the Dutch empires each sent their own spies out to try and discover the maps of the other side, because these were secret documents and they were being drawn up for the first time and they became very major um, items of the secret service and espionage uh, at the time. If you look at the 18th and 19th century atlases, many of which unfortunately are taken and the pages are taken out, if you go to auctions, particularly to manuscript auctions where they're selling maps, you'll often find single page maps from 18th and 19th century atlases, which actually were taken out of atlases because they get a lot more money when they sell them as individual uh, sheets. But maps at that time were much more of an art form than they are today. Today, of course, they're much more accurate. They're on Google satellite, they're on digital maps, just go into Google Maps and put in any address anywhere in the world and it'll tell you where it is, how to get there from whatever place you want. So we have much greater accuracy today. There's probably less that you can distort today, but of course they don't have the same art value and uh, the same beauty that the hand-drawn maps of the 18th and 19th century had. There's been a lot of material written about this, um, taking off the famous uh, quotation, how to lie with statistics. Mark Mamonia wrote a book about how to lie with maps. There's a book about maps and politics. Um, and I find this uh, stuff very fascinating and interesting, which is where my work both on borders and on maps within Israel and Israel-Palestine sort of play a uh, part. Within the case of, it, of Israel, both sides have their own atlases. Um, I have a copy of this Atlas Israel, which was one of the last big copies of Atlas Israel, which was produced before everything became digital. They'll show you the same outlines, the same borders at the outlines, but they'll show you completely different information and different languages within the atlases itself. And it's very interesting to open a page of any particular area and compare the information that is given in either of these atlases. And there's been quite a lot published about the conflict itself. The most recent being the one you see in the middle has literally been published just a few weeks ago by um, retired the Colonel Shaul Ariely for the Truman Institute. Um, it's an atlas which has come out in both Hebrew, English, and Arabic. And actually, you can download it as a PDF file. The maps are very simple there, but it gives you a very good overview of the Arab Jewish conflict. Of course, before then, the famous atlas was that of Martin Gilbert, and there are others like that. Because we're used to looking at maps which uh, tend to be on the Israeli side, I thought I'd show you a page of one of the maps um, in the Atlas of Palestine, where they show you a very interesting comparison there of the different settlement structures. Uh, whether you want to see an Israeli presence or a Palestinian presence. And just recently, this excellent book by two of my colleagues, The Politics of Maps, has come out. I just wrote a review of it for the Times Higher Education Supplement just a few weeks ago, and it covers a lot of this material, this, this more academic general material that I'm uh, talking about. 
But maps are always used to represent, to throw forward images. And if we look at the history of how our parents and our grandparents came to know about the map of Israel stroke Palestine, because it was obviously before the establishment of the state of Israel, it was always known as Palestine, the British mandate of Palestine. So of course, one of the most common ways we used to see maps was from the JNF Pushka at home. And here I've taken just three examples, but there are 20, 30 examples in the Zionist archives or in the Ben Gurion archives in Stay Boker, in, uh, which is part of our Ben Gurion University, which show you how the map was represented over a long period of time. Um, without the first one you see, Karen came at Israel, uh, without any boundaries um, uh, in between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. The one in the middle doesn't show boundaries, but it does show the development of Jewish settlement in the 1930s and 40s. And it shows you more or less how the green line came about, because you can see very clearly the contour um, of what later became the green line. And if you look at the, um, if you look at the uh, uh, third one, the Jewish National Fund here, Geula Titnula Aretz, um, again, it's already after the establishment of the state, so the West Bank is in there. And of course, for many of us growing up in England, or certainly in the pre-digital era for our parents' generation, most of whom had probably one of these boxes on their mantelpiece at home, this was the map you would often get, the image that you would get of Eretz Yisrael, of Israel, and so on. And many adverts um, were used around the concept of maps. Uh, I collect them, uh, I like the physical ones, I sometimes so it mooch around auctions around the world looking for some. Um, but of course, today you can download pictures of virtually everything. There's some tourist stuff here. Mifal Miuchad Latsala. They were raising money to um, uh, bring the Olim in the immediate post World War II, post state era. And you can see that most of these types of maps just have a Mediterranean Sea and a Jordan River with nothing in the middle, um, which tends to indicate the date they were made or a political position they wish to, uh, to put over. I'm going to talk in a few minutes about my particular plate, but plates are fairly common to have maps on. I, I found a few dispersed through the internet. I have a colleague, a very well-known, an eminent professor of geography in the United States of America, who over his life has collected maps, real maps on plates. And two or three years ago, actually we were doing a bit of a tour of America in the summer and we drove via his town um, and he invited us home and on his walls he has something, he has on the walls about 150 such plates of a collection of 350. It must be the biggest collection of maps on plates anywhere in the world. Um, and it's quite fascinating. Of course he goes around, he's a very serious collector. He searches the auctions for new ones uh, the whole time, but it's a common way of depicting the maps or the places we know. And the final example I want to show is, of course, the way that we use Palestine as a term on maps. Um, what you will find of great interest in all three of these adverts is that these were all produced in the 1930s by the Jewish agency. So there's no propaganda going on here. These are all about Palestine as the Jewish agency used to see it, um, trying to get tourists to come to Palestine Help the middle one help him build Palestine, and in at the bottom it says in Yiddish, help him boy near Israel. You know, it's a Yiddish thing saying to people come to Israel. The one on the right is for to say these are the best tour guides to come and see uh, Palestine, and the one on the left where it says come to Palestine, I added underneath the quotation which is on the picture, which is from Shir Hashirim which is and in the English you say for lo the winter is past the rain is over and gone the flowers appear on the earth and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land so it's a it's a very interesting way of remembering despite the fact that of course it's not the term we associate with today as they say as an understatement this was the term used even by the Zionist movement and the Jewish agency in the maps and the presentations they used to show beforehand. But of course, today, this is the way the term Palestine is used, um, drawing on very similar background features to those which you saw in the previous maps, although they've all added a horrible concrete wall because it is a horrible 
concrete wall, whether we think it should be there or shouldn't be there. It's a scar on the landscape. And you can see how Palestine is used. And I just took two of them and put them together. And you can see, you know, to a certain extent, the way that people play about with names to depict places um, to sell their own particular messages and so on. Um, if you're very interested in this, you can look at different types of maps. Uh, if any of you want to take a screen picture of this, you'll see two links there, one showing Jewish agency maps, past and present, one showing Palestinian, Arij, the um, Association for Research, I can't remember what it's called, in Bethlehem, which shows its own style of maps, and they're very interesting to compare and to contrast. And then we come on to the second stage, which um, I wasn't sure whether to put the second or the third stage the other way around, but I thought I'd leave the plate to the end because then it would become more understandable. Obviously, the borders of Israel have changed tremendously. Dual borders of Palestine, Israel have changed tremendously um, over time. Uh, we often think of borders as things. We see them on maps. They must have been there for hundreds of years. And we forget that many of the world's borders have come into being only a short time ago. Um, and uh, they become sacrosanct very quickly. An example I'll give in a minute is the Green Line of Israel and the West Bank, of course, which came into being for the very first time in 1949 and was partially opened or removed or opened following the Six Day War in 1967. But it became very sacrosanct in a short period of time. Map, maps and borders are much more dynamic, they're much more fluid than we tend to think of them as. Just very quickly run through this list. Think of all the times and even this isn't a complete list of the number of times the borders have changed in Israel stroke Palestine over just 100 years, from the Ottoman Empire to the sykes Pico and San Remo, which most of us don't really understand. There's tremendous, the second best collection of maps in the world is at the British Library in Houston. Um, and they had a few years ago um, a conference about geopolitics and they put on an exhibition of some of their most interesting maps. They have hundreds of them, thousands of them, some of them very valuable. And they put up some of the original sykes pico maps from the 1917, 1918 period, which are really fascinating. Um, we tend to throw around this term, oh, well, it all goes back to sykes pico or San Remo, but um, uh, you need to go into that area with much more understanding to see how this created the original maps which became the British and the French mandates, how the British and the French uh, divided the territory up between them so that what we see today is the border between Israel and Lebanon was pretty much the border which the British and the French mandates agreed upon back in 1920 or thereabouts. They're the partition proposals, they're the UNSCOP United Nations proposal which was voted on to create the State of Israel. There's the State of Israel itself, there's the 1967 war, there were the Camp David peace agreements and the later agreements with Jordan, the Oslo Accords. Today we have the separation barrier. We don't know what will be in the future between Israel. Will there be a Palestinian state? Won't there be a Palestinian state? Will there be a border? What will the maps look like? So this is a very dynamic process going on here. There have been 10, 15 different maps and borders in the space of only 100 years. We often forget that many of the Central and Eastern European borders that we know about only came into being after the end of World War I, and uh, state for every nation, the Woodrow Wilson idea, which was at its height at the time, and how ethnic groups were divided up and separated between, uh, between territories. It always throws up that famous story, I'm sure some of you have heard it, about the um, uh, uh, person who lived in the early 20th century and tells his grandchildren, you know, when I was a young kid, um, I lived in, I can't remember the exact country, let's call it Romania. And when I was a student, I lived in Hungary and, or in Transylvania. And when I was working, I lived in Hungary. And by the time I retired, I was back in Romania. And I asked my grandfather or my great grandfather, how is it possible that in a pre-mobility era, you moved around so much? And he said, I never once left the house I was born in. Just that every 10 or 15 years, there was a war and they redrew the boundary and I became the citizen of a different country. Um, and although that's told as a joke, it's very much what happens when borders change so rapidly in a small area in a small part of the world. Here are some examples, picture examples to show what I've just said. <clears throat> and I could have 
you know, I just chose any one of these. Uh, there are many diagrams like this, which show the changing maps. Um, this is only from 46 onwards. It doesn't even show the uh, period of the mandate and the Ottoman Empire and so on. And you can see how quickly the maps change because of the political situation, because of wars, because of peace agreements, sometimes in our favor, sometimes in the favor of the other side. And the fact is that to this very day, for a small country, Israel has five separate border regimes. And now I'm not even talking about the maritime boundaries. Actually, it has more than five. It has a border with Lebanon, which is an armistice line. It doesn't, it has a border with Syria, which was an armistice line until 67. And now, of course, the Golan Heights is in between those two lines. It has a border with Jordan, which is recognized as part of an international peace agreement, but not the part between the West Bank and Jordan, because Jordan refused to sign on documents with Israel over that over the West Bank part. Has a border with Egypt. Um, we have we did have a green line, we now have a separation barrier wall, fence, whatever you want to call it, with the West Bank. We have a very sealed border with the Gaza Strip. We have maritime boundaries. Um, if you go to a lap, you often forget that you're right at the meeting point of four boundaries of Egypt, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia, which is only a few kilometers away. And each of those borders has a different form of management, a different border regime. They change over the time. So for a small country, Israel has a lot of different boundaries. If we look historically, you can see also how this has changed. So this was the sort of proposal that was put forward in the 1930s. Uh, you know, the Peel Commissions, the Woodward Commissions, and the red that you see on this map was what they wanted to give to the Jewish state at the time. Uh, these are later maps of post-World War II, um, <clears throat> the eventual UNSCOP partition plan. You can see the um, that in the right one, the orange were the parts of territory that was going to be an Arab state. The green was the part of territory that was going to be a Jewish state. That's actually the plan that was voted on, very similar at UNSCOP, uh, the United Nations in November 1947. Um, but of course, the actual boundaries, as we'll see in a minute, came out to be very different. If you compare the 1930s to the 1940s, what happened, of course, during World War II, none of this discussion or, or negotiation continued. By the time they came back after World War II and there was greater pressure for the establishment of a Jewish state because of the Holocaust, um, but by then the Zionist pioneers had moved further south. They'd set up the 11 famous points in the northern Negev, and in the 1930s it was never even discussed that the Negev would be part of a Jewish state, whereas by the 1940s this was put into all of the proposals. So again, the geographical facts on the ground changed the realities <clears throat> and enabled for a much more favorable map for the Jewish state. In the end, of course, because of the war, the War of Independence, this is the map that came about. Had everybody accepted the original proposals from the United Nations and there had not been a war, it could well be that the State of Israel would have been created around this map, the um, uh, United Nations Resolution 181. But as it was, there was a war in two parts. And this is what came out at the end of it, at the Rhodes Armistice Agreement. And it's very interesting. I don't know how many of you have done this before. If you put on a map, the borders of 1948, imposed or superimposed upon the partition agreement. And you can see the difference <clears throat> in those borders. Even the 1948 borders were described by a great left-wing dove, the great foreign minister and diplomat, the, probably the greatest Israel has ever had, Abba Eban, even he described the post-48 borders as Auschwitz borders. And yet these were far better than the borders that were proposed in the partition resolution. I am amazed today at how many of my students at Israeli universities do not know the difference between the partition boundaries and the boundaries of the state of Israel. They don't know this part of history sufficiently well. They don't look at maps enough and they're not sufficiently aware unless they're really interested in Israeli and Zionist history to know that these two maps were significantly different to each other. Um, and then again, as we come back to the first part, they were represented in different ways. And um, we ended up with something called the Green Line. Um, I, I give separate lectures on the Green Line. It's a topic I've published a great deal about in the past, 
The green line is, of course, the boundary which um, came to separate Israel from the West Bank and um, was in place from 1949 after the Rhodes Armistice Agreements until 1967. Um, in 1967, of course, Israel captured, conquered, occupied, liberated, use whatever term you like best. I'm not here to make any political points. The West Bank, and some argued that the Green Line was now erased. Um, and there are many questions concerning the Green Line. You can um, read them for yourself. I'm not going to give a lecture on the Green Line now. But it was never really erased because, of course, Israel never passed any formal law of annexation to most of Yudav Shomron, the West Bank, as it did to East Jerusalem and to the Golan Heights. So even though the physical presence of the Green Line was removed immediately after 67, for a period of about 30 years until we built in the last 15 years, the separation barrier, nevertheless, it still functioned as an important administrative boundary. There were governments, when David Levy was the Minister of Housing, who wanted to remove the green line from the maps and from the schoolboy textbook, from the school textbooks. There were other governments when Yuli Tamir was Minister of Education who made a point of putting the green line back into the school atlases and into the school maps, which brings me back to the first point of saying that maps are a very important way of socializing new generations into understanding just what the map of our country looks like with a green line, without a green line, and it becomes a very political issue at the, um, at the, end, at the end of the day. Um, there is one way of knowing exactly where the green line was, and that is by following the municipal boundaries of Israel. <clears throat> Back in the early 90s, together with a colleague, uh, Victor Orgard, we produced, <coughs> we produced, excuse me, an atlas of Israel's regional councils and by following the lines of the regional councils very carefully, um, we were able to de define exactly where the green line was, whether it existed in physical presence or not, because there are no municipal administrations in Israel which overlap the green line. Either you live in a municipal administration, which is in Yudav Shomron, or you live in the municipal administration, which is in pre-1967 Israel. The services are the same, uh, the taxes you pay are the same, etc. But nevertheless, the actual boundaries remain exactly in C2, exactly as they were prior to 67. It's probably the only accurate way of defining where the green line is uh, today. And then after that sort of discussion, the 48 boundaries, we come to the plate itself. So as I said at the beginning, um, I was in the office of this rabbi in a synagogue in Florida, and I saw it on the wall. I said, what is this? Where did you get it from? I'm interested in maps. I've never seen this before. He said, it's always been on the wall here. I said, you know, would you like, instead of my speaker's fee, I said, would you like to give me the plate? He said, no, I can't do that. So I then set about looking for this plate over time. Occasionally, it came up on auction, but people were asking absolutely ridiculous prices for it. So I never bought it. Eventually, Earlier this year, I found it somewhere in America. Someone obviously didn't know its value. For about $30 for the plate and about another $25 for postage, he sent it to me. However, the plate disappeared in the postage and was last seen in Yugoslavia in the postage system. I thought, oh dear, I've lost that one. And then I saw it come up at an Israeli auction. And um, so I thought, whatever happens, this auction was in Netanya. Uh, where my late parents-in-law lived and where now my son lives. So I was going by there anyway. And I'm not going to say, but I paid a ridiculous sum to take it from him. And three days afterwards, the package from America turned up. So I now have two here. And meanwhile, by the way, as an aside, I've discovered there's another plate, the one on the right, which you can see the colored map. Um, I'm still searching for that. It's much harder to find. If any of you ever come across one of these, please do let me know because I would like to get my hands on one of them. But let's look at this interesting map on the left. It's not just the map is on the plate. There are some very interesting elements about it. Before I do that, I should just say, you can see <clears throat> this is where I found it an auction at one point. 
And but let's look at the issues of interest. First of all, and the most interesting point, are the borders of the state of Israel after it has been established. And if you follow on what I've been saying for the last 20 minutes, or most of you probably knew this, the borders that it shows are the borders of the partition resolution. They are not the borders of the state of Israel. It was produced as a commemorative plate. Obviously, there were Zionist organizations in North America, which were just waiting for the day when the state would finally be declared. Obviously, after November 47 and the vote of the United Nations, um, they were just waiting, waiting, waiting to be able to produce all sorts of commemorative events and items in honor of the new state of Israel. And the minute it was known that the state was going to be declared two days later on the 15th of May, this plate was produced and sold. I don't think in a huge amount, but obviously it was sold in different places around America. Now, there are a number of interesting things. First of all, the boundaries are wrong because the boundaries are the boundaries of the partition resolution. They're not the boundaries of the state of Israel. You could say they were right because it was immediately after the state was established and then the war of independence started and it took another one and it took another year until the war had finished, um, until the Rhodes Armistice Agreements had defined what the final boundaries of the state of Israel would, uh, would be. But nevertheless, it's the only, so you can really date this plate as having been produced between the establishment of the State of Israel, May the 15th, 1948, and the final demarcation of boundaries. But then look more carefully at this plate and you'll see that the date below says May the 14th, not May the 15th. So as soon as they knew that the next day the date state was going to be declared, they immediately came out with this plate. And um, look at what it says at the top. I'm sure the present day Israeli governments would not like this. It says the Republic of Israel, because um, they obviously, um, it was only known literally in the last few hours it was going to be called Israel. It was obviously produced, by the way, the following week after the establishment, even though it says, but obviously they'd already put May the 14th on the plate and not May the 15th. Because of course the name of Israel wasn't sure literally until a few hours before the actual declaration came into, into being. Um, and there is another, of course, is the famous Herzl quotation, if you will, it is no legend, Imtiritsu Enzo Agada. Did he really say this, or is it just myth that is associated with him? We will never really know, but that's on the background of the plate. And one other very interesting thing on the back of the plate, um, um, if you look at the right here, on all the plates, it said dedicated to the pioneers of Palestine, which, of course, if you were to say this to a younger generation today, they would say, oh, you're pro-Palestinian, you're anti-Israel. But this plate, which was produced to commemorate the establishment of the state of Israel, was dedicated to those pioneers who had come to pre-state Palestine, had um, developed the first kibbutzim and the first moshavim and the first institutions and had... Um, and had, uh, and had um, uh, basically created and founded the State of Israel. <clears throat> I found over time another few items like this. I saw that this had been put up for auction, but unfortunately I found it only in an auction site which closed, uh, which was two years ago. Um, it's a, um, the details are here again. As you can see, the map, um, it's somewhere between, it's more the map of, the United Nations resolution, and it is the map of Israel. It has Balfour 211, 1960, 1917, um, commemorating the, Balka, the Balfour Declaration, the symbols of the tribe of the menorah. And uh, here you can see, it has an explanation. It's a napkin printed in certain colors, map of Palestine with UN partition plan, um, and, and so on and so on. So it was very common at that time. If you look at the JNF boxes, you look at these napkins, you look at these plates, for the map to hold a very prominent place in all of the commemorative events, both because it was a matter of pride and also because um, this was be and the leadership at the time wanted people to get to know what the map of the new emerging entity was going to look like. And again, if I could find one of these, I would love to get my hands on, on one. I did find out um, I went to the Kedem auction people and said, look, I saw 
that this and the other plate I'm looking for were on your auction site two years ago. And I see they were neither sold. I said, you know what happened to them? And of course, if any of you go into auction sites, you know, you're never told who the actual seller of any item is. I said, look, would you be prepared on my part to talk to the sellers to see if they ever sold them, if they still have them, if they're prepared to sell them to me? And they came back to me to say, unfortunately, in both cases, the original sellers are no longer alive. So we can't continue this discussion. But again, this is another very fascinating item showing the map somewhere between the partition vote of 47 to the actual war, to the actual establishment of the state, um, which uh, was used to commemorate uh, the, the emerging or the newly established Eretz Israel, the state of Israel um, in the Spanish speaking countries. When I, about six months ago, uh, playing around with Facebook as I do, um, actually this was actually quite a serious topic for what I put up on Facebook. I don't usually talk about my real work on Facebook, I prefer talking about Anglo-Jewish history, about Tottenham Hotspur, um, about other items, but I, I got this plate and I was so proud of it, I put a, a short description of it up on my Facebook site. And someone came back to me and said, you know, I've seen that plate somewhere. It says, do you know the film Crossing Delancey? I'm sure most of you know that film. It's a great schmaltzy Jewish film um, of about 20, 25 years ago, of two young Jewish people, one who's escaped the um, East Side and is now working in the Upper West Side in a very modern bookstore, um, and he's and she's being um, she's being courted by a young Jewish guy who still lives in the East Side and runs the famous Gus Pickle store, which actually was there until ten years ago. Because after I saw the film and I was in New York, I went down there to buy some pickles. I bought six of his famous pickles wrapped them up in silver foil, put them in my case, and that evening flew back to Israel with them. Unfortunately, Gus's pickles store is no longer there. And there's an old bobber there, an old Alta Bubba, who is the grandmother of the girl, um, but she's on the side of the man. She's still back in the old east side, and she gets them together. And he said, have you ever seen that film? I said, sure, I have. Have a look at the end scenes when they're getting together at the very end and look on the wall. And hey, presto, what do you see on the wall? You see my plate. Um, this was obviously very common um, uh, for a certain generation of Zionist Jews living in America. This was very common as a commemorative item uh, to um, show the plate in Israel. So what's happened is that I looked for this plate. It fitted in very nicely I suppose, they're curios about the work I do on borders and maps. And it showed something very interesting about the way that we use maps to sell ideas, to commemorate events, and how important maps and borders are in our understanding of the world in general and of Eretz Israel in particular. Thank you. I can't hear anybody. Yes. You're on mute. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, Professor Newman. Fascinating. Um, if you would like to ask a question, raise your hand. Stephen, Stephen, you have a question. OK, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. OK, um, I'm getting through this book called uh, Aronson's Maps. Aaron Aronson from the early 1900s, um, the Aronson family, Zichron Yaakov, etc. <laughs> And my question is, to what extent are his maps well known in the academic circles? And would you like to say something about it? Because I've got to the point where it really, really explains what his maps were, apart from being to do with his vision for water um, distribution in Israel, which was the vital element, which they didn't have at the beginning of the 1900s. First of all, there is an absolute wealth of historical maps about Israel and Palestine from every possible perspective. Actually, I mentioned Professor Brava at the beginning of the lecture. He, when he was still very involved with the geography department in, in uh, Tel Aviv University in Yad Avner, he built up probably um, the best collection of maps and of old maps um, about Israel, in Israel, Palestine, of anywhere in the country. And I think eventually 
I'm not sure you'd have to ask my colleague, Professor Gidon Bega, but I think eventually they were donated or bought out by, I think, by the National um, Library and not necessarily by Tel Aviv University Library. There is a wealth of historical maps. I don't know if any of you are familiar with a friend of mine in gold or green, Dr. Simon Cohen, Dr. Shimon Cohen, who is yeah. a retired medical person. He probably has the best collection of private maps of Israel and Palestine anywhere in England. Um, and um, phenomenal. I went round there about two years ago, and he just has some amazing maps, and they're worth a lot of money as well. I mean, they're the, some of them are very original and unique. And different people have brought out collections, atlases, like the one you mentioned here, about maps of a particular period, of maps of a particular theme. Um, I'm more interested in the human and the social and the political aspect of maps, but of course there are many physical and geomorphological and water uh, maps and so on. And there are a number, I mean, I look at maps as a, in a sense, on the side of what I do in geopolitics and border studies. There are a number of well-known academics in Israel, particularly at the Hebrew University, whose special, speciality, whose specialism focuses just on maps and on the history of maps of Israel. And certainly this is a book which is known, which is well known about and is used in order to teach about different understandings of um, Palestine and Israel of the past hundred years. Sorry, so this is a well-known, his maps are well-known and his- I wouldn't uh, say they're well-known. You have to you know, be interested in maps to know about them. Sure. Um, but if you're interested in maps, you would have come across his maps, yeah. Um, I have a question. Uh, in, in fact, it, the question was written on one of your slides, but you didn't really talk about it. The question of why the Green Line is called the Green Line. There's lots of different um, stories. Yeah, there are many different stories. And, uh, and uh, what are the answers that usually come up with? Uh, the two classic answers, although there are more, one is, of course, that Israel plants trees on its side and the other side is all barren. And therefore, um, it's a very clear green line. Uh, the other famous answer is, of course, that when they were drawing up the maps in the Rhodes Armistice Agreement, they only had a green pen. <laughs> um, and uh, that is what happened. Now, if you want to know the truth, it's actually the second answer and not the first answer. They wow. only had a green pen at the time, um, despite the fact that if you do drive around the borders of the West Bank, I live in Meitar in the south of Israel. I just literally two kilometers south of the southernmost point of the green line. I often drive to Jerusalem, to Gush Etzion, uh, via the West Bank, not around. I go through the barrier and out at the other end. And if you're now driving along and you look at Yar Yatir or Yar Lav, you do actually see the forests all planted on one side of the road and on, on the other side. And if you look at satellite maps, not just now, satellite maps of 20 years ago, even the Israel-Egypt border before they put the fence up, there was a very clear difference in the colors on each side of the boundary, not so much because of planting, but because Israel had a much stricter policy for political reasons about keeping the Bedouin grazing away from the border, whereas on the Egyptian side, there were no such policies. So the, the sheep used to graze right up to the border, and on the Israeli side, they weren't allowed near the border, and you could see that very clearly on the satellite map. You didn't need a fence or a road to see where the border is. But the actual historical truth is because of the Green Line. But there was a much bigger problem, as Brava showed in his book. He was interested in the borders back in 48 already. And he showed that when they actually came to implement the Rhodes Armistice Agreements on the ground, as I mentioned to you in the talk, they found that the actual um, pen was more like a felt pen than a biro, and it was this thick. Now, if you put this thickness on the line, it covers a huge expanse of area. And when they were actually putting up the fence after 49, they found that the line covered whole villages. And they had to decide what side of the line would this village be on? Would it be on the West Bank side or would it be on the Israel side? And there were all sorts of on-the-spot agreements <clears throat> by local commanders. This comes out very well in his book, Vulot Eretz Israel. He talks about it a great deal. And in some cases where they couldn't agree, they grew, they split the village into two. The classic example being, of course, Bet Safafa between East and West Jerusalem. Um, but uh, 
this was known as the green line. The green line became synonymous with lines separating ethnically contested entities throughout the world in Beirut, in Cyprus, in Northern Ireland, in Belfast. But our green line is the real McCoy. <laughs> it's the original green line. Wow, I want to know that. Um, do we have any other questions? Yes, no? Well, oh, Stephen's got another one. Good for you, Stephen. Okay. Um, there was a lot of excitement last, uh, last year when uh, Trump brought out his peace plan. And then all of a sudden, we had to wait for the maps, the new maps to be drawn. Blimey, after all the maps they must, they've, they've, you've, you've, you've mentioned that they've had, how much tweaking did it require? And we still don't have the maps over a year later. And we're not going to get them either. So uh, <laughs> you can be rest assured of that. <laughs> you know, one in the immediate post-Oslo Accords era in the 90s, for a period of about 15, 20 years, I was involved in a lot of what they call the track two discussions. And obviously I was involved in the commissions or the committees that dealt with the issue of boundaries. And I would say that the name of the game from the Israeli side was always, how much can you change the green line by including as many settlements as possible on as little amount of land as possible? And there was some real cartographic ingenuity, particularly about people who didn't understand that there are certain places on the landscape, you can't, you just can't draw a border through, you know, the middle of a, a deep ravine or, or, or whatever. Um, and there, you think there are a lot of maps, you haven't seen a small percentage of the maps that have come up at different discussions and work groups and workshops. The one thing I would say about that is someone who has traditionally supported the classic two state solution is that not for any ideological reasons, but for real pragmatic reasons, I don't believe you can draw such a line anymore. I don't think you can do for the last 10 years because what happens with lines is that geographic and geopolitical realities, they change the facts on the ground. It's all very nice to come and say, I believe in two states and what we have to do is take a photo of where the green line was in 1967 and go back to that position. But of course you can't, not because you're for or against it, because the realities have changed in such a way. Um, you may disagree with settlement policy in your Shamron, but you can't ignore the fact there are half a million people living there. And I'm not even talking about Mizrahi Rushalayim. And that's changed the geographic realities. You can't ignore the fact that from 1948 to 67, when the green line really existed as a boundary, between Jordan-controlled West Bank and Israel, um, a period of 19 years passed from 1967 until today, almost three times that length of time has passed. And in that three times of well over 50 years, the geographic realities have changed to such an extent that if you do want to reach an agreement, and this is, I didn't want to get too involved in the, in the politics of this here today, um, but if you do want to, you have to bilaterally discuss some new form of border or borders, because there is no such thing as a clean line, a single line, which can uh, divide the, the, the future territories. And let's not forget that even in 1949, it was a bad line. It was a line based on realities of the time, where the armies were, where the exchange agreements were made, what deals were done, how Israel gained control of Vadi Ara by uniting with Jordan to get the Iraqi forces out of there because Jordan wanted them even less than Israel wanted them there. So the realities of today are the realities which will dictate whether or not there will or won't be a future line, which means there's always going to be new maps out there. And clearly that one of the biggest encyclopedias in the world will be to bring together the literally hundreds and hundreds of different ideas of maps which have been out there and put them all in to one collection. So, so what you're basically saying is that even though the politicians all said, we're going ahead, just do the maps, take a couple of months, and then when they actually started working on it, they realized that it would be impossible. Look, you do need um, 
cartographic and geographic experience. Uh, Brava argues in the introduction to his book that had they consulted with him and not with Ruth Lapidot, who was a lawyer, over the issue of Taba, at the Pan Camp Davies Agreements, he would have showed them old maps, which she didn't know about, um, which would have proved that there would have been a greater Israeli claim to having Taba on the Israeli side than on the Egyptian side. He may be right in terms of his evidence. I don't think he's right in terms of what the outcome would have been, because there was huge international pressure and arbitration for the line to come out as it did um, at the end of the day. But at the end of the day, it is a political decision. If you, you know, it's a political decision and there is no such thing as a, as, as the optimal line, there is no such thing. And therefore deals have to be made and those deals are going to be made by the politicians, not by the cartographers. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, Steve, you have an, a question? Uh, yeah. So uh, on the Lebanese border, there is the dispute about the Shabba farms. Can you say anything about that? Yeah, the Shabba farms is just a red herring. Um, the Israel-Lebanon border, the border to which Israel withdrew again um, under Barak, was, is more or less identical to the border which was drawn up between the British and the French mandate 100 years ago. Um, there is an argument about the Shabba farms because Syria are involved here. But I always say that the issue of the Shabba farms like the other question which is often brought up, how do you link the Gaza Strip with the West Bank, with the West Bank, which are two disconnected pieces of territories? These are relatively minor issues, which can be blown up out of all proportion when you don't want to reach an agreement. If the two sides, which they don't have today, had leaders who wanted to reach an agreement, they could be resolved in no time. And the truth is. Um, you know, is in the eating of the pudding that in the immediate five, six years following the Oslo Accords in the early 90s, there was an agreement in place for three transition routes between the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, one which was never implemented because it went through Jerusalem and Israel wasn't prepared to allow that to happen. <coughs> but one went through um, Kiryat Gat and Tarkumia, the other goes right past my front door in Meitar and through the south of the West Bank. And during that period before the Oslo Accords collapsed, for all the reasons it did collapse, there was a huge daily movement between the Gaza Strip and the West Bank with virtually no problems whatsoever. At the time, the Japanese proposed building a bridge. Someone else proposed an underground tunnel, which by engineering standards today are certainly not impossible. Um, but so these are issues which can be blown up in order to um, make sure an agreement doesn't work if the leaders don't want it to work. If leaders of both sides want agreements to work, these are not major issues, not the Shabar farms and not the link between the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. So, so in other words, where there is a political will, there is a cartographic way. Uh, cartographers can only offer their professional advice uh, to the extent that politicians want their advice. Um, I, I, at one stage, before all the digital maps came along, I was part of a project where we were going to look at maps again and uh, through a GIS, a geography information system. This is about 25 years ago uh, when digitization was just beginning to come in. It wasn't as freely available as it is today. And um, one, one side, the Israeli side, said, oh, yes, this is a great idea. And the French government were going to fund it, but on the condition that it was equally available to both sides. And at the time, the Israeli side said, no, we want the information for ourselves. We don't want it to be for the other side. Of course, today, that may, it's irrelevant. Today, anyone can just, I have a little, you know, USB disk with digitized maps of the whole of Israel and the West Bank. I can get down literally to the level, the resolution of a single street. I can see that if every half a kilometer, I move the border this way or that way, because of all sorts of uh, reasons, strategic reasons, water, environment, settlement, whatever reasons I want, I can come up with 5 million different borders, literally at the half uh, kilometer scale or even the hundreds of meter scale. That was only beginning 25 years ago and they thought they could keep this information as a big secret. <laughs> so, and in the end, the French government said, well, in that case, we're not going to fund the project. Um, but of course, at the end of the day, cartographers can assist 
um, geographers can assist, all sorts of planners can assist. But at the end of the day, these are political and geopolitical decisions. Can I show you this? I don't know if you can see it. It's, oh. uh, uh, it's on metal. It's a 1913, a map that was put together by the Palestine Exploration Fund. So it's something I inherited from my parents. Uh -huh. oh. I don't know if you can see it, but if any, at any time you're interested, I could try and arrange for you to see it once okay. we don't have... There's a great book, I can't remember what it's called now, um, you know, one of these picture books which show maps of different parts of Eretz Israel about 10 years ago and the same place 100 years ago. And although obviously they've become more built up and the next things, the basic road structure where the main roads are and the main routes are, it, you can see from above how similar they are even after 100 years. Mm -hmm. Do you know how old it is? Did, oh, you said 1913, did you say? This map you've just shown us? Yes, yes. Wow. Oh. You shouldn't have shown him or to make you an offer for it. <laughs> <laughs> I've, had, as, oh, I've always remembered it being on the wall. My, my father had it in, in his dining room, which was also his library, and, um, and I inherited it somehow. Yeah. We, re, we had it re, reframed. And by the way, Professor Newman, my mother was Vera Nabarro, and she worked with your mother on Meals on Wheels. Yes, absolutely, Meals on Wheels. <laughs> I would say if, 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 if Hob was her big project when she was in Israel, then Meals on Wheels was her project, which became the family project for all the years <laughs> that we grew up in North London. You know, as, right. kids, as kids, if we ever woke up in the middle of the summer vacation and my mum said to us, what are you doing today, David? And I didn't have a quick enough for an answer that seemed <laughs> legitimate. She says, right, we need you on one of the vans today. <laughs> Um, of course, at the time, I thought it was terrible. In retrospect, it was a very good education and understanding about the Jewish elderly and the Jewish poverty left behind when they yeah. all moved to the suburbs. Yeah. 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 Anybody else? Any other questions, remarks? No. Okay, so it just uh, remains for me to thank you very, very much. Ah, sorry, Daphne. Daphne has a question. Yes. I to commiserate with Professor Newman. He has a Spurs. Um, banner on his wall <laughs> and they are really doing terribly this year. Tell me about it. <laughs> uh, I was lucky fortunate enough to leave last night's sorrows behind and attend my grandson's bris this morning. Uh, oh, but, uh, awesome. I've set up just oh, recently as Leslie Michaels will attest a very interesting group WhatsApp group of Tottenham supporters in England and in Israel with a number of chief rabbis, a number of community leaders, um, an exclusive group, we should call it. Someone could easily write a story about the protocols of the elders of Tottenham. But as you say, it's not a great year to brag about it. Well, OK, speaking as a, as a West Ham fan, fifth in the league, Thank you very, very much. It's been wonderful. It's lovely to have you. And thank you for agreeing to speak to us and have a round of applause. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Yeah. Okay. Good evening. And good evening. And tomorrow for tomorrow, Shabbat Shalom. Bye. Shabbat Shalom. Chodesh Tov. Ah, Chodesh Tov. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. I'm signing off. Bye. 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 Oh, so nice to see you all. Yes. David, yeah. Lillian, David yeah. Lillian, how did your AGM go? Uh, yes, it was quite. It was quite good. We had a, a lot of fun. Maybe ask Valerie. She's a sort of uh, independent advisor. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, well, you, we had a lot of fun, didn't we? We did have a lot of fun. The AGM is not here, is it? Uh, the AGM was. The problem is the was... snake in the dinner. <laughs> well, Heim was there as well. Total right. wasted yeah, time. Warren was there. <laughs> time. A few other people. We had, but afterwards we had a, a lot of fun with the round robin there. Uh, yes, yes. A good format for Zoom as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. well. One of these.